In police museums all over Europe, there are items of evidence that have brought some of the world's worst criminals to justice. Behind every object in these crime museums is a fascinating and sometimes macabre story. In the Poisoner's Almanac, there are some substances that have been used again and again in the pursuit of murder. Arsenic is a good example, but other less obvious substances have also proved attractive. And our first case in the 1970s shows just how accessible poisonous substances could be. Even a schoolboy could get his hands on them. This is the story of a man who was perhaps one of the most obsessive poisoners of recent history, who killed not for any of the usual motives, but rather for the love of poison itself. Graham Young was a compulsive poisoner. He graduated from experimenting with animals to poisoning three of his relatives. Later, he killed two workmates. At one time, he had enough toxic chemicals at his home to kill 300 people. In May 1971, Graham Young started work at Hadland's factory in the village of Bovingdon, Hertfordshire. The factory specialised in high-speed photographic and optical equipment. 23-year-old Graham Young was to work as an assistant storekeeper. Well, my first impression of him was that he was very quiet. He was reserved, he sort of kept himself to himself. Um, there was just something about him that was peculiar which you just couldn't put a finger on. Though seen as a bit of an oddball, Young's colleagues did their best to be friendly and he in turn would reciprocate, passing round rolled up cigarettes to his workmates and offering to fetch them cups of tea. On the 3rd of June, the storeroom manager, 59-year-old Bob Eagle, had become ill with a stomach upset. Just five days later, another storeman also became ill with diarrhoea, stomach pains and a burning in his throat. While away from work, their symptoms abated, but once back at the factory, they returned. Soon, Bob Eagle was complaining of numbness in his fingers, aching and pain throughout his body. Eagle's doctor sent him straight to hospital, where he was put in intensive care. Within hours, he was all but paralysed. I can remember what Graham's action, reactions were, because I was with him at the time. He said to me, well, Diana, why is it they can't find out what's wrong with them? He referred to him constantly, almost obsessively. Just over a month after Bob Eagle first complained of illness, he was dead. And the cause of death was attributed to bronchopneumonia and polyneuritis. Not long after Bob Eagle's death, other colleagues of Young started to complain of sickness, pains, diarrhoea and hair loss. Some feared that the water was contaminated. The local doctors just called it the bobbin and bug, whether it be diarrhoea and sickness or just a common cold. I was asked to go in the stores to help Graham because of the other men being sick. So for another pound a week, I stayed there. And I think it was about June when I was going home a good twice a week with diarrhoea and sickness. My immune system broke down completely so that I was allergic to everything. It affected me mentally. For instance, when I was cooking, the gravy wouldn't get thickened up. And when I asked my husband to come and sort of give it a stir for me, he said, well, you're mixing coffee instead of gravy granules. Fred Biggs, who was in charge of distribution, working closely with Young in the stores, had already suffered the sickness. But by November, he was in great pain. He couldn't stand or walk, and his skin started to peel away. He died after 19 days of incredible suffering. By now, the factory was near to panic, and the firm's doctor was brought in to address the workforce. He tried to calm fears by explaining that there was no radioactive leak from the former airbase, or anything in the factory itself for them to worry about. And when it came to question time, Graham was the only one that stood up and asked questions. He wondered, didn't all the people's symptoms match those of thallium poisoning? Why had heavy metal poisoning been ruled out? The doctor was alarmed, because it had been his secret fear that heavy metal poisoning was involved. After the meeting, he engaged Young in conversation, and Young, enthusiastically, displayed his knowledge of poisons. Hadland's doctor went to see the factory boss and told him how strange Graham Young had been at the meeting. And afterwards, though reluctant to believe that one of their own employees was involved, he contacted the police. Scotland Yard ran a check on all the Hadland staff and came up with the shattering news Graham Young was a convicted poisoner. Well, that evening I was very ill and it was very late and the doctor knocked on the door. And from then on, I had the biggest medical that you could wish for. They took blood, took hair samples, skin samples, water samples, everything. The detective put in charge of the case happened to be at a meeting with forensic scientists. He described to them the symptoms of the men that had died at the factory, and the scientists immediately came up with the same answer. 
thallium poisoning. Thallium nitrate, the poison that Graham Young used, is a white crystalline substance. It's very soluble in water and has got no taste. Its estimated lethal dose is around about one gram, and it's probably this amount that killed Bob Eagle. It was evident to those who had suffered at his hands that Young had used cups of tea, which he made with casual regularity to poison his colleagues. The tea wasn't any different looking. No, you didn't taste anything. Sometimes you had a, a burning feeling in the throat. It was always after a cup of tea or coffee that they'd become ill. Most had put it down to the water. No one suspected Young. I never, ever saw him do anything. Never, ever. He'd say to me, why haven't you drunk your tea? And I'd say, I don't like it, it tastes horrible. He used to hold his thumb between his finger like that and obviously held a little phial of some sort in there and administered it like that. Although Headlands had known that Young had spent much of his youth in an institution because of a personality disorder, they had no idea that he had a history of serious crime. In fact, as they were to find out, at the age of 13, Graham Young had been sentenced at the Old Bailey to 15 years in Broadmoor, the top security psychiatric hospital, for the criminally insane. Young's interest in poisons had begun when he was a child, and by adolescence, he'd become fixated with experimenting with them. Astonishingly, he had been able to buy poisons, antimony and thallium over the counter of his local chemist. His family were the guinea pigs. He would put the poison antimony on their food, then observe the various symptoms. On one occasion, he gave his sister a dose of belladonna, and it was this incident, as well as the agonising suffering of his father, that eventually prompted the family to voice their concerns about the lad. When Young had been arrested the first time, Fossils of poisons were found in his school blazer. When he entered Broadmoor, he was one of its youngest patients. He was intensely obsessed with poisons. He had a very wide uh, knowledge of the subject, but he wasn't very deep and he was strangely uh, lacked in curiosity. He wasn't very interested in the scientific basis as to why poisons killed people. He was interested in the fact that they did. I've met a number of uh, serial killers and what is striking is that they describe either an ability to have an empathy with other people, more particularly to have lost it. And they seem to lose it about puberty. Young spent much of his time at Broadmoor reading, but as his sister recalled in a book about him, it was usually books about poisons or his other favourite subject, Adolf Hitler. But gradually there seemed to be an improvement in him. He stopped talking about poisons and it appeared that his obsession had passed. On the 4th of February 1971, after eight years, the Home Office agreed to Young's release. Whilst in Broadmoor, Young had applied to police forensic laboratories and a pharmaceutical company for work, but all of them had turned him down. Then after a spell on a training scheme in Slough, he applied for the job at Headlands. There was no mention of his conviction for poisoning, but as soon as he had secured the job, Young reverted to his old ways. Just six months after starting work at the factory, Young was once again arrested for poisoning. When his bedsit was searched, powders, bottles and a diary were found. The diary was entitled A Student's and Officer's Casebook. Young eventually confessed that the coded writings in the diary related to people he was poisoning at Headlands. It listed in great detail the changes that occurred in each victim as he increased their poison doses. Of Bob Eagle, he wrote, he is surviving far too long for my peace of mind. The ashes of Bob Eagle were recovered and analysed. This was the first case in British legal history where the ashes of a person who had been cremated had been used to detect a poison. There are very few poisons that will survive such a process. Thallium is one such poison. Okay, then. When we were in court, when it was my actual turn to go into the witness box, Graham was only a few feet away from me, and wherever I looked, I could see him from the corner of my eye, and he never took his eyes off me once. And when I did walk out, he got this smirky smile on his face. He seemed to enjoy himself trying to outscore the prosecution. But when the jury returned its verdict, it was clear that they hadn't believed a word the young man had spoken. He was found guilty of the murder of Bob Eagle and Fred Biggs, as well as the attempted murder by poisoning of four other colleagues. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. At Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight, Graham Young died at the age of 42 after serving 18 years. His death was attributed to natural causes. Our next case in which groundbreaking toxicological work was done shows how a substance that many people are familiar with, nicotine, was used to deadly effect. On the 22nd of November 1850, in the village of Berry in Belgium, the local priest was visited by a group of servants who came from the nearby chateau 
the home of the Count and Countess Okami. The distraught servants had come to him because they feared that the previous night a murder had taken place at the chateau under their very noses. The Countess's brother, Gustav Funi, who had been visiting for the day, had died shortly after an evening meal. The death seemed anything but natural. The priest summoned the magistrate, who together with three surgeons set off for the walled and moated Chateau de Bitremont. When the group arrived there, the Count and Countess reluctantly showed them the room where Gustav's body lay. The room was dark and eventually, against the couple's wishes, the shutters were pulled back. Okami claimed that his brother-in-law had died from a stroke. But as the officials leaned over the body, he did his best to hide Gustav's face with his hands. His mouth was all blackened and corroded and he had scratches and cuts all over his cheek and his face. When the surgeons examined him, it seemed as if he'd been forced to drink some corrosive fluid. It must have been obvious that Gustav hadn't died of a stroke. The body was carried to the coach house for examination. The magistrate ordered the surgeon to remove all the organs that might be useful for examination. He stood by as they put everything into vessels of pure alcohol. He then arrested the Count and Countess. It was a big scandal at the time because of uh, the social status of the accused. Uh, the Count of Bocarmé and Lydie Founy were uh, members of the aristocracy. They owned a castle, they owned land, and they were rather famous. One didn't have to look far to find a motive for the murder. The now ruined chateau was once very grand and needed a great deal of money to keep it going. Count Bocarmé thought he'd found the answer to his money problems by marrying the rich Lydie Founy. The reasons for the marriage with Lydie were simple. She wanted to be a high society woman, but she was from a bourgeois family, although wealthy. Whereas the Count was debt-ridden, but he had a title, he was a Count, and he had a coat of arms. Things didn't improve financially when Lydie's father died, and by the 1850s, the couple were reduced to borrowing from their own servants. It was Lydie's brother, Gustav, who had inherited his father's wealth. Gustav had never been very strong, and after the amputation of a leg, had been very ill. But Gustav's health picked up, and before long he was heard to be thinking of marrying. Bokami's hopes for inheriting now looked in jeopardy. And it was at this point that Count Bokami started to take an interest in chemistry. Under an alias, Bokami studied with a professor in Ghent, inventing a story about relatives in America who were being attacked with arrows poisoned with nicotine. He said that he wanted to learn about nicotine, which the Native American Indians extracted from tobacco leaves. Then in order to carry out experiments himself, Okami purchased huge quantities of equipment and set up his own laboratory in the grounds of the chateau. The servants were told that the sacks of tobacco leaves were for making eau de cologne. But Okami was refining a technique for what he thought would be the perfect murder. If injected into the bloodstream, the nicotine from one cigar is enough to kill two people. And Bokami believed that, as a vegetable poison, it left no trace in the victim. The Count had read a toxicology book which stated that nicotine could not be detected in body organs after death. But unluckily for him, this was at the same time that Professor Stas, the foremost expert in toxicology in Belgium, was also learning how to extract nicotine from body organs, which is most unfortunate for the murderer. Stas was informed by the surgeons who had examined Gustav's body that he had quite probably been killed by sulfuric acid. But as soon as Stas received the organs, he immediately ruled this out. Stas had developed a method to isolate nicotine from stomach contents and body viscera. The basis of the method is a digestion with sulfuric acid and then the mixing with alcohol. This is then filtered several times, the alcohol is lower to evaporate. And after a couple of days, a brown sticky residue would be present. He tasted the residue, it had a bitter taste, a smell of tobacco, and also had a burning sensation in his mouth. Stas concluded that the poison he had isolated was the alkaloid nicotine. Articles from the chateau were brought for his examination. They included the floorboards from the dining room. These tested positive for both nicotine and blood. In the grounds of the chateau were also found some rather decomposed cats and ducks, which Bakame must have been um, experimenting with to see if he could get the dosage right. Uh, a tricky business. There's no real way of knowing how much more you need if you're going to poison a cat uh, as to uh, poison your brother-in-law. More animals were destined to suffer in the course of this case. Nicotine was poured into the mouths of two dogs. With one dog, 
John Stas then administered vinegar into the mouth. The poor dog showed the same blackish burns that had been found around Gustav's mouth. A complete picture of the crime was pieced together. Gustav had arrived at the chateau on the morning of the 20th of November, 1850. He came with the news that he was planning to marry a young widow. Countess Bokami spent the whole day with her brother before she and the Count sat down with him for dinner in the late afternoon. The Countess made sure that everyone was out of the way. The children were sent upstairs to have their meal with the nanny. Um, and the maid was told to retire after the second course. It must have been going dark then because she came in a few moments later and offered to bring them some light. Both the Count and the Countess shouted at her, Oh, no, no, not yet, not yet. So they must have wanted cover of dusk to do their, their dirty work. A little while later, a cry was heard. It appeared that Gustav had been pinned down by the Count while the Countess poured the nicotine into his mouth. The nicotine had splashed over him and his neck and face had been burned. The symptoms of nicotine poisoning include vomiting, delirium and loss of strength in the muscular system before paralysis and death. The dose was large enough to have killed Gustav within five minutes. There was an extraordinary commotion. It was a scene worthy of Shakespeare. The Count was like a madman. He had the body undressed and washed with lots of soapy water and then poured some vinegar in the ears and mouth. The Countess had the floor washed and then did it all over again once it was finished because she found it wasn't done properly. She was intent upon having the stains removed, stains which I myself saw and that have now gone because the old landlord a few years ago had the floorboards replaced. The Countess herself stooped to scrubbing, but in the end burnt various items of his clothing the next day, his cravat and his gilet, and in fact burnt his crutches as well. It's extraordinary, really, that these people would act in such a, a crazy way that having murdered the brother-in-law, they then get the servants in to help them clean up after them. Do, do they think that servants don't tittle-tattle amongst themselves or that... Or perhaps they thought that they were above the law because they were the gentry. The net closed in with great speed around the couple. Police eventually found the apparatus that Bokami had used to produce the poison. And together with Stuss's scientific findings, the prosecution case was complete. The trial was quite uh, quite something. It turned into an, a pantomime, actually, because um, they tried to implicate each other. The uh, Count of Bocarme would say that he didn't want to blame his wife, but he was always implying that she was the one behind the whole scheme. While the Countess of Bocarme, Lydie Founy, was saying, well, I was afraid of my husband, um, he forced me to do it, etc. So they um, tried to implicate each other. In the end, Count Bocarme was sentenced to death but the pretty young countess was acquitted, probably because the jury couldn't face sending a female aristocrat to the guillotine. Count Bokami was executed on the night of the 19th of July, 1851. Torches lighting the scaffold, and Jean Stas earned lasting fame for his method of demonstrating the presence of nicotine, a method that is still fundamentally the same as that used today. Poisoners stand out as particularly sadistic murderers, they don't flinch at inflicting painful and often the most drawn out of deaths. Though some poisoners, like Graham Young, seem to crave detection, a classic case of murder must advertise. <laughs>